At the Marzo, north of Rome, there is a garden known as the Sacred Wood. Like many Renaissance gardens, it's a work of art which dramatizes man's place in the natural world. But this is a garden like no other ever made. Salvador Dali was fascinated by its dream monsters and strange texts, but it's more than a piece of surrealism ahead of its time. Although it is in many ways an eccentric place, the garden at Bomazzo is no mere freak or folly. Indeed, its apparent weirdness, the fact that so many of its meanings have been lost or obscured, is precisely what makes it so poignant. Here, you can almost see the culture of the Renaissance receding further and further into the past. I can't think of a better place than this to begin to try to understand what happened to Renaissance civilization during the course of the 16th century, as it changed and developed and took on a multitude of new forms. The garden was the work of one man, Pier Francesco Orsini, whose palace overlooks the woodland below. In this green theatre, a succession of strange shows unfolds, ingenuity and grotesquerie battling it out. Hewn from the living rock, art no longer wants to imitate nature, but to triumph over it. An almost oppressive wit and ingenuity are written into Bomazzo's very stones. You who enter here, tell me whether so many marvels were made for deceit or only for art. At the top of the hill, a temple commemorates the death of Orsini's wife, Giulia Farnese. Orsini said he made his garden to sfogare il cuore, to relieve his aching heart. But from the seed of private sorrow, something larger was to grow. A meditation on the frailty of all human hopes and of all civilizations. The presiding theme in this Renaissance theme park is the cruel passage of time, a playing with decline and fall. The disturbing angle of the leaning house gives an eccentric framing to the rest of the garden, suggesting things going awry and askew. This miniature tower of Babel, built to look as if it's falling down, is an apt emblem of late Renaissance civilization itself, in love with its own artfulness and wit, but increasingly aware of the possibility of its own passing. Bomazzo was a retreat from a world that was growing ever wider that had been divided by the Protestant Reformation and circumnavigated by the explorer Magellan. Understanding of this world was increasing, and whatever the background of political or religious differences, commerce was the dynamo driving the new world order. One of the busiest ports in Europe was the city of Antwerp. Since the 1520s, it had become the northern center of maritime trade. Spices, tapestries, wine, commodities from all countries flowed in and out of its harbour. Traffic in goods was accompanied by what the Elizabethan philosopher John Dee called the inter-traffic of the mind. <laughs> 
Ideas flowed from place to place with ever-increasing rapidity, penetrating every corner of Europe. But this was more than just the import-export of Italian civilization. The culture of the Renaissance was itself being transformed. Nowhere is this more obvious than Antwerp's splendid 16th century town hall. A typical Flemish building has been embroidered with a multitude of classical details. The inscription SPQA equates the city with Republican Rome. Side by side with a traditional hipped roof, this is Antwerp's way of saying that it knows all about the Renaissance and is part of it. But another, more influential republic also had its centre in this city, a republic of letters. The publishing house of the Golden Compasses has a deceptively cloistered feel, but this was one of the powerhouses of late Renaissance Europe. Here, under the gaze of its proprietor, Christophe Plantin, pioneering scholarship came together with the latest print technology. A new world was being created through books. The humanist intellectual elite who gathered here included physicians, moralists, and also Abraham Ortelius, the cartographer who compiled the first modern atlas. Ortelius's book was called The Teatrum Orbis Terrarum. Its title seems to acknowledge the spectacular way the world was opening up before men's eyes. This portable guide to the globe was a much republished bestseller. This was knowledge the market wanted. books were containers, not just of new information, but of styles and fashions that were to transform the shape of Europe. They were the pattern for the future. exploring the world that lay within himself, too. In Plantin's edition of the work of the Flemish anatomist, Andreas Vesalius, the figures demonstrate what a thoroughly Renaissance enterprise this is. Being flayed is no excuse not to strike an elegant pose. Variations on classical sculpture, with or without Roman armour, are used to display the inner workings of the human body. This is the Renaissance unmaking itself. Investigations like these were opening the way for a new age of experimental science, and the presses never stopped. The book industry was driven by demand, and the scale of Plantin's operation was a measure of the growing hunger for knowledge which developed during the second half of the 16th century. Plantin produced nearly 2,000 separate publications on these printing presses, and he sold them not only in the Low Countries, but all over Europe. This wasn't just one of the largest printing and publishing houses of its time. It was a crucible of cultural change. I can't help thinking just how far we've traveled since this journey through the Renaissance began. Going back just over a hundred years to a work of art such as Jan van Eyck's altarpiece of the mystic lamb is like entering another universe. It's a vision of divine majesty expressed in glittering surfaces held in perfect balance. Painted before the Reformation had dissolved the certainties of a united Christendom, every gleam of light in this world is the light of God. 
Van Eyck's naturalism is at the service of religious truth. Observation and faith are inseparable. But they've come apart in the post-Reformation landscapes of Peter Bruegel. Working in the same tradition of northern oil painting as Van Eyck, Bruegel's another great observer. But God's presence isn't so easy to discern in the hunters in the snow, where the labours and pleasures of man are shown in a kind of cosmic balance with indifferent nature. It's full of vivid snapshots of life, an old woman carrying sticks, a little girl warming herself at a bonfire. Bruegel's art doesn't betray a lack of religious belief, but it suggests that faith will have to be worked at. We have to find God. He won't come looking for us. The Gloomy Day is another picture which encapsulates Bruegel's most important legacy. The idea that every life, no matter how apparently insignificant, has its own truth. Bruegel seems so absorbed by the world he's depicting that it's as if he's gone beyond moral judgment. This is a completely unsentimental observation of the way life is. The artist has helped us almost to feel as well as to see the nature of a peasant's existence to experience the bitter cold and freezing winds suffered by people as they scratch out a living on the land. Bruegel, like his friend Ortelius, the mapmaker, was a great broadener of human horizons. The Northern Renaissance was opening up a series of world views, too multifarious to be limited within the word Renaissance. The story of how the Renaissance ended in Italy is very different. For one thing, we know more about it. This time capsule of a house in Arezzo belonged to the man who first coined the term Renaissance, writing its history just as it was beginning to unravel. Giorgio Vasari was a painter and architect but he's most famous as the author of The Lives of the Artists, in which he set forth a grand view of the ascent of man. Describing the Rinascita, or rebirth of art and letters that had taken place in Italy during the previous 300 years, he proclaimed that a new golden age had come to pass. The very walls of his house claim that he is a man who's lived through the revival of an antique past. He wants us to see that he is literally at home with the ancients. In one corner, there's a self-portrait of the artist as author. It was in his book that he explicitly ranked the art of his own day as the pinnacle of human progress. But then he had to ask, what next? In his book, Vasari wrote that art has now risen so high that its decline is to be feared rather than any further progress to be expected. He also compared art to the human body, having its birth, its growth, its old age and its death. It's as if the very structure of his thought betrayed a sense, however reluctantly expressed, that Vasari's own lifetime perhaps coincided with the end of the very Renaissance he'd chronicled. Vasari believed that his golden age of art could live on forever, but only if everyone followed the example of a great genius. And there's no doubt that for him, that man was Michelangelo. 
which Vasari held up to his contemporaries as a true wonder of the age was Michelangelo's Medici Chapel in San Lorenzo in Florence. Nothing in this space is inert. Every architectural detail has been fashioned with high artifice. The Medici's mortuary chapel has become a vivid theater. The architecture of a grand facade has been perversely turned inside out. And as always, Michelangelo has placed the human body center stage. The artist has used the commission to frame his own meditation on worldly glory and death. The idealized portraits of the Medici are upstaged by beautiful figures on the sarcophagi that represent the times of day. The face of dusk is unfinished, but this only enhances the feeling that these are monuments to their creator. We sense the presence of what might have been. How novel and shocking the nudity of these figures must have been in a chapel where masses were sung for the dead. Michelangelo was a hard act to follow, and while he was an inspiration to many, you could also argue that his influence drove Renaissance art off the rails. By reinventing his style with each new work that he created, Michelangelo introduced a kind of fertile insecurity into Renaissance art. Many of those who came after him felt that they had to be original, a heavy burden which is still being carried by artists today. Michelangelo intensified a growing spirit of competition and helped to create a culture in which every painter, sculptor and architect had to have their own distinctive maniera or style. In the late 1520s, while this was still a work in progress, the Medici were deposed and Florence was gripped by religious fervor. When the Angelus bell rang, every citizen had, by law, to genuflect and recite a prayer. The new mood was to be reflected in the spiritually intense works of Jacopo Pontormo. For three years, Pontormo shut himself away in the church of Santa Felicita. When his painting was finally revealed, it seemed to cross the line into a new world, where the rules of perspective have been abandoned for the sake of emotion. This is a moment of loss. The dead Christ has just been lifted from his mother's knees to be carried to the tomb. Every face and gesture contribute to the almost hallucinogenic sense of grief. It's a painting heavy with the weight of responsibility. And to communicate his own sense of guilt for Christ's death, Pontormo has included his self-portrait. Mea culpa. The colors of his picture are vivid as if in a vision. The drapery often skin tight, giving a tactile quality to the bodies. <laughs> 
paints a picture about wanting to touch, to bring back the dead, to kiss blue lips back into life. While Pontormo in Florence was creating an art of almost agonized introspection, a great painter in Parma, in northern Italy, was inventing a far more exuberant and theatrical work. Correggio drew on many local traditions, including the illusionism pioneered by Mantegna and the effects of light and color explored by artists in Venice. All this was to be synthesized in a great masterpiece for the cathedral, designed to sweep the audience off its feet. Though the dome is octagonal, Correggio's heaven is seamless. His subject is joy, expressed by a spiraling perspective. Like a tornado, a twister, it whirls us into the exhilarating ether of paradise itself. of the blessed are arranged with men on one side, women on the other. Above them all is a figure who may be Christ, or an angel, but who seems to be floating, or perhaps falling. The originality of Correggio's work disconcerted some people. The story goes that one of the canons of the cathedral compared it to a stew of frog's legs. But the great Venetian painter Titian came to Correggio's rescue, saying that the artist's reward for creating such a masterpiece should have been enough gold coins to fill the dome itself. Personally, I'm with Titian on that one. Correggio was a hundred years ahead of his time. He invented the theatricality of the Baroque. He also anticipated its rapturous sensuality. Jupiter and Io was painted for Federigo Gonzaga of Mantua. The king of the gods descends in the form of a cloud to seduce a young maiden. As she surrenders to her shape-shifting lover, what's happening on Correggio's painted surface is as subtle as mist itself. In Mantua, Correggio's patron, Federigo, yearned to escape from the prison-like atmosphere of the Gonzaga's ducal court. The Palazzo Te, begun in 1527 on the site of the Gonzaga stud farm, was a dream palace and the height of architectural fashion. Its designer, Giulia Romano had trained under the great Raphael in Rome. On an unpromisingly flat site, 
he created a spectacular work of courtly art with pleasure as its principle. The palace changes aspect as you walk through it, offering a succession of unfolding views. Every facade plays a different variation on the classical orders. Every detail plays a role in this theatre of surprise. Blocks from the frieze have apparently slipped out of place, while keystones are lifted out of line. This is a building confident enough to pretend its own collapse. The restlessness and instability which characterised so much Italian religious art from the 1520s onwards also found expression in the Renaissance courts. Here too the rules of art were bent and broken, not for spiritual self-expression, but for a laugh. Welcome to the House of Fun. The inside of the palace is equally dedicated to variety, a succession of painted rooms to amuse the patron and satisfy his vanity, while pulling a few cunning stunts for the spectator. Julio reflects the Gonzaga's interest in breeding by tethering portraits of their favourite horses to the walls. and the pursuit of pleasure accelerates as you move through the palace. As antiquity became fashionable among patrons, it lost its air of idealism and became a mirror for the pleasure seekers. There are always enough people for a party at the Palazzo Te. The paintings allude to Federigo's amorous pursuit of Isabella Boschetti, an illicit affair which can only have been inflamed by Giulio's hardcore mythologies. While the Palazzo Te delighted its patron, it also did wonders for the reputation of Giulio Romano. He's the only Renaissance artist mentioned by Shakespeare. Where once the Palazzo Te was set in the middle of an artificial lake, now it's in a municipal park next to a funfair. I think there's a kind of poetic justice about the juxtaposition. If we're looking for an end to the Renaissance, there's a kind of ending here, or at least a change after which things would never be the same again. After all, the fairground's just a democratised, low-culture version of the Palazzo Te. Here it's images for all, not just a few. But there's much the same combination of vulgarity, mock piety and whirligig excitement that Giulio Romano provided half a millennium ago. The image-hungry, channel-hopping sensibility of modern times was, like so much else in our world, made in the Renaissance. If there's a single art form which embodies the 16th century infatuation with artifice, it has to be the fountain. Nothing so dramatizes the transformation of nature itself into art. And nowhere has more fountains than the Villa d'Este, 
Built in the 1560s for Cardinal Ippolito d'Este, it now has over 500 water jets to delight, surprise and sometimes drench the spectator. The fountain is a symbol of inexhaustible creativity. It's a work of art which is endlessly fascinating because it's constantly altering its shape. This garden is a fitting monument to a culture which was in love with variety and fascinated by change and metamorphosis. Water is elemental, sensual, mobile. Here, the pleasure palace has overflowed its bounds, and it feels as though the world itself has turned into a work of art. In this case, at the expense of about a quarter of the town of Tivoli, which the Cardinal demolished to make way for his garden. Fountains also symbolized a flowing continuity with the classical past, the source of inspiration. At the far end of the garden, a figure of Diana of Ephesus, an ancient nature goddess worshipped in classical and early Christian times, whose influence had even played a part in shaping the mother cult of the Virgin Mary. Her transformation into a fountain was an entirely Renaissance idea. It typifies a growing determination to explore the more exotic tributaries of the antique past. Villas were a refuge from the city, but what about the art of the city itself? Florence, once the very capital of Italian Renaissance civilization, was a measure of just how much had changed. The Piazza Signoria was where the people of Florence had always assembled, for triumphs, spectacles, and for protest. Even today, they bring their demonstrations against the common agricultural policy here. This was the heart of a Republican Florence, which had, at least intermittently, resisted rule by a single autocrat. All that changed in 1537, when Cosimo de' Medici came to power. He turned Florence from a republic into an autocracy and the Medici from bankers into princes. He was an efficient, ruthless ruler. Outwardly respecting the forms of republican government, he used his own network of informers and secret police to make sure he got his own way. In taking a state, wrote Machiavelli in The Prince, the conqueror must commit all his cruelties at once, so as not to have to repeat them every day. For the first fortnight of his reign, there were four public executions a day in this square. Florence now had a prince who knew his Machiavelli. The space in front of the Palazzo Vecchio was called the Aringhiera, from which we get the word harangue. It was an arena of political debate, but Cosimo and his dynasty turned it into the gallery of public art that we see today. Inside the Palazzo Vecchio, Giorgio Vasari was given the project of transforming the former Republic's seat of government into the residence of an autocrat 
He eventually spent 17 years decorating it. Here, Cosimo's transformation of the city literally involved the erasure of the past. To create these tributes to Florentine military muscle, Vasari painted over incomplete works by Michelangelo and Leonardo. Vasari himself was unstinting in praise of his own work. I venture to assert that I have occasion to paint everything that the human mind and imagination can envisage. Above his scenes of ingenious violence, at the very centre of the room's ceiling, we find who else but Cosimo, the apotheosis of the prince. Cosimo de' Medici, the man who never gave audiences to the people of Florence, certainly gave them a lot of art. Art to entertain them, art to stun them, but above all, art to remind them that he, Cosimo, was the boss. But I can't help feeling that something went missing from the spirit of Florence during his reign. It's as if, despite the richness of all that he commissioned, something died here. Cosimo's most important commission was one of his first, the giant bronze figure of Perseus and Medusa by Benvenuto Cellini. It was to stand in the Piazza Signoria alongside the works of Donatello and Michelangelo. But whereas earlier sculptors had provided role models for the citizens, this is a work designed to subdue and to subjugate. The hero is inscrutable, alien in his beauty. The statue's under restoration, but I can't help thinking of a post-mortem. Cellini described the drama of its casting as a tale of triumph in adversity. Difficulty overcome, grace, ingenuity. These were the qualities most prized at the time, and Cellini delivered them all. The Perseus was conceived in a spirit of intense competition. Though it's currently been removed from the Loggia dei Lanzi, the piazza still contains the works against which it was measured. Alongside Michelangelo's David was the more recently erected statue of Hercules subduing Caicos. This thumping great symbol of might was created by Baccio Bandinelli, Cellini's arch rival. Cellini mocked it, calling it a sack of melons. Art for Cellini was about winning. Perseus is victorious, not through the brute strength and knobbly muscles of Bandinelli's Hercules, but through grace and guile. Aestheticism and absolutism had been perfectly fused. Cellini started his career as a goldsmith and made the Perseus only after returning from another court where he created what has to be my desert island object of the period. It's a salt cellar for Francis I, the King of France. Yes, it really is a salt cellar. Peppercorns in an Ionic temple next to the goddess Earth. And opposite, salt in a boat beside a reclining Neptune. The whole thing rolled on concealed casters, and the king, of course, loved it. According to Cellini himself, the King of France said that his work not only equalled, 
but surpassed that of the ancients. Like many of Cellini's anecdotes, that probably needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. But that's not to underestimate the tremendous appeal which Cellini's ingenuity and his mastery of Florentine style must have had for a monarch such as Francis I. A vogue for Italian Renaissance art and artifacts was sweeping through the courts of Europe. This was an object of high fashion, the 16th century equivalent of a Fabergé egg or a solid gold Gianni Versace watch. Francis transformed the chateau at Fontainebleau, once little more than a medieval hunting lodge, into what Vasari compared to a new Rome. The chateau has been much expanded over the years by successive French rulers, so much so that Napoleon described it as the true home of the French kings. Some of the first Renaissance architecture ever seen in France can be found here. But if you want to see the French king's dream Italian makeover, you have to go inside. of Francis I was decorated by Rosso Fiorentino, whose works are complemented by extravagant stucco surrounds. Rosso's somewhat damaged and obscure mythologies had an allegorical significance for the life and ambitions of Francis I. In one painting, Francis is depicted in Roman dress, perhaps to identify him with Caesar, who unified Gaul. With the rapt attention of his onlookers, he's probably explaining the significance of the object in his hand. It's a pomegranate, which, made up of many seeds, is a symbol of the state, the elements of which are brought together in the person of the king. All of which is obliquely reinforced by the stucco work, which has pomegranates prominent amongst its abundant fruit and veg. Nature, too, obeys the king. The whole gallery is an enigma, a space appropriate to a man who kept the Mona Lisa beside his bed. It used to be thought that Francis I himself was the only person who really understood all of the complicated meanings hidden inside the pictures. The English ambassador said that the French king kept the only key to the room in his own pocket. But this cryptic and self-contained space was to have a huge influence. It was here that the rulers of France first got a taste for elephantine classicism. The style introduced at Fontainebleau was used throughout France to bolster an emerging sense of national identity. Classicism became the language of the nation-state's self-importance, and it's been in more or less constant use ever since. From its origins in a particular moment of Italian influence, to the gigantism of Napoleonic conquest, and into the present day. The Louvre is the largest palace in Western Europe. Begun by Francis I, it's grown in the same classical idiom for centuries, with the odd Egyptian interlude. With its acres of impersonal Franco-Italian at Piazza, this building doesn't represent the revival of the classical past. Here, antiquity has been appropriated, turned into a trophy. It's another of the many strange deaths of Renaissance civilization.
The dissolution of classical art and literature into the bloodstream of Europe was anything but straightforward. Back in Italy, the church's response to the Protestant Reformation would produce the closest thing there is to a clear-cut end to the Renaissance. The Council of Trent, which sat from 1546 to 1563, gave voice to a campaigning confidence on the part of the church. It revived the Inquisition and created a climate of censorship and control. Though Michelangelo died in Rome, his funeral was held in Florence, in San Lorenzo, which still lacks the marble facade which he designed for it. The elaborate ceremony was paid for by the Medici, another propaganda coup for Cosimo. A year later, in the same church, Agnolo Bronzino painted one of the more disturbing pictures of the 16th century a virtuoso display of the negative side of Michelangelo's legacy. Its subject is the gruesome martyrdom of St. Lawrence. Bronzino, who had been court painter to the Medici, has contrived to turn the scene into an elegant academy of poses. An example of the cult of variety transposed to religious painting to which the Counter-Reformation was implacably opposed. And in this case, you can see that point. A martyrdom enacted by ballet dancers and acrobats, this strikes me as a rather uncomfortable picture, as well as an extremely artificial one. It is, perhaps, the classic example of late Renaissance artifice pursued to the point of absurdity. A picture so full of ingeniously contrived poses that it's almost impossible to concentrate on its subject. According to the Council of Trent, art was to provide an accurate, unembellished narrative of the saint's life. Its purpose was to encourage piety, not wonder at the artist's ingenuity. If we want to see the kind of art the church had in mind, we have to go to Rome. From 1580, the church of San Stefano Rotondo became a center for priests being trained to propagate the faith amidst the hostility of the Protestant reformers. On the walls is a fresco cycle of 31 scenes of martyrdom. The Counter-Reformation was calling for vivid, simple and extremely literal art. And it certainly got that here. The paintings were raw material to help priests meditate on saintly martyrdom and its lessons. As such, issues of aesthetics were of minimal importance. The counter-reformers wanted to recover the simple piety of St. Francis. It's as if they wanted all their artists to be Giotto's again, to go back to the beginning to the directness of the early Renaissance. You can't turn the clock back, and I think that this attempt to return to the very beginnings of the Renaissance really marked its end. The lifeblood of Renaissance art had been the license to invent and to innovate, and the church's openness to experiment had been a vital part of that. But there's no trace of it in here. These are dead pictures, as well as pictures of dead people. <laughs>
The Counter-Reformation dream of going back to basics was doomed from the outset. What has once been learned and savoured cannot simply be unlearned and forgotten. It wouldn't be long before artists working for the Catholic Church armed themselves once more with all the many seductive devices, the erotic, the theatrical, the virtuoso, with which Renaissance culture had furnished them. What the church wanted from art was results, and soon it would be using every trick in the book to get them. Bernini's blessed Ludovica Albertoni is 17th century. We call it Baroque. But it could never have come into being without the Renaissance. Bernini is like a stage manager, organizing everything. The lighting from a concealed window to capture the fleeting moment when the saint's soul leaves her body. The fluid drapery, possessed by an almost erotic energy of its own. This is truly the art of transformation. There are no absolute endings in history, and the legacy of the Renaissance flows on. Petrarch's great invention was the metaphor of the rebirth of a radiant classical past, which can speak to us and in which we can see ourselves. Successive ages discovered that it could be used to dignify any individual as a Caesar or Cicero, dress up any ideology in the pure white toga of virtue. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, the 19th century English public school, the examples seem endless, yet they all found something they were looking for in the trappings of an antique past. At the Stadio dei Marmi in Rome, we can sense the power of the classical dream for Mussolini's fascist regime of the 1930s. The appropriation of the Greco-Roman physical ideal is undeniably impressive. But we know too much about the repression of the system that built it for it not to seem irrevocably tarnished. Even so, haven't we been here before? Isn't there something of the spirit of Michelangelo's David, of Cosimo's Florence shared by these figures, which now seem comically butch, borderline kitsch? But there's a clue here to the most persistent Renaissance legacy of all, the vivid image of man perpetuated in art. If these statues no longer speak to us as their creators intended, they do get through at the more basic level as human bodies in stone. Most 20th century art has been dominated by an antagonism to Renaissance forms. The Italian futurists got the ball rolling by threatening to blow up the Uffizi. In a world where a pile of bricks earns a place in an art gallery, the Renaissance may seem well and truly dead and buried. And yet... of man, the image which seems to preserve the spark of life, that was brought back to the public realm by the revolution in piety with which this series began, 
still holds impressive sway over all our imaginations. The camera is a mechanized way of creating Renaissance perspectives. And what cinema but a fresco cycle at 24 frames per second? The Renaissance retaught us to desire images of living reality. And by the time of Shakespeare and Bruegel, it also taught us something new about the human consciousness we were looking for there. Renaissance art, but vivid, realistic imagery. Pictures of men and women that look like real men and women back at the center of human existence. That imagery may have been endlessly transformed during the course of subsequent centuries, but the fact is that it's still there. Everywhere you look in modern life, you're confronted by representations of the human face and form. So even if the culture of the Renaissance is a thing of the past, its legacy is all around us. We hope you've enjoyed Renaissance. In a moment, to look out remembering Jacqueline Dupre for next week. Then stay with us as Compass profiles Archbishop Desmond Tutu.